Morning everyone, how is everybody? Thanks for joining me today as you come on, really great to have you here. Today I'm going to be discussing snacking. So what I'm doing is I'm actually going to be doing a two day little masterclass on snacking. So today I'm going to take you through some things about snacking, how it affects your metabolism, what it does with your hormones and then tomorrow I'm going to do a Q&A. So 11 today and 11 tomorrow. Um, for coming up to an hour. So today I'm just going to be taking you through, through some things and then tomorrow I'm going to be doing a and a I actually got tons and tons of questions. So tomorrow I'm going to be talking about, you know, snacking with your kids, best things to snack on. Is snacking good for your hormones or not good for your hormones? If you've got diabetes, what should you do? So I've had tons and tons of questions. So I will be answering those tomorrow. So... For those of you that don't know me, my name is Naomi Judge. I'm a naturopath and clinical nutritionist, and I help women connect the dots between their health, their happiness, and their hormones. And the reason snacking is something that I actually wanted to talk about and why I wrote a blog on it, and I'm doing the Facebook Live series, and I'm going to do a summary of this. I wanted to include it because it's really important when it comes to your hormones. It's really important to understand food habits and how they affect your hormones. Not only just um, your sex hormones, but also your appetite hormones, also your adrenal hormones. All of those are affected by what you eat, when you eat, how often you eat. So it's important to understand that. Now, of course, we are all different. Different things suit different people. So I totally get that. But we really need to have it nutted down. We really need to understand with diet. Diet needs to be supportive. It needs to be something that just supports us through the day balances our hormones, helps regulate our blood sugar, and supports inflammation so it doesn't cause inflammation. And so it's important to know that the things that we did learn previously, we've been told previously, you know, snacking, you should be eating every couple of hours, is good for you. It's good to understand that there are some circumstances where it's not the best thing to be doing. So I want to run you through that today, and I want to talk about what snacking is all about when it comes to your hormones. The reason I'm interested in it, not just because of what it does to the hormones, but I used to be a crazy bingy snacker. I used to eat fruit all day, like constantly. I remember when I was a kid, I used to eat like six satsumas through the day, maybe an apple, uh, maybe some chocolate, maybe some crystal. I was actually constantly, I was probably eating something an hour, I remember as a kid, like that constant snacking. Not so much when you're at school because you're not eating between in class, but when I was at home or doing homework or revising for exams, it was that constant eating every hour. And, you know, it wasn't hunger. For me, it was obviously boredom, maybe stress at the time, so lots of different factors going on. And that constant snacking, no matter whether it was something healthy or whether it was something sugar-laden, that kind of laid the groundwork for what my metabolism was later going to turn out like. Hence today why I need to be really careful. I need to keep it super stable. I need to keep my diet stable. I need to keep everything stable so that my hormones stay nice and level. Otherwise, I just get those ups and downs. So that's why I researched this and I had a look around and I was like, what is really, what is really going on here? Because we've got people that support fasting. We've got the 5-2 diet. We've got diets where they say days on, days off, fast for 12 hours. Then we've got the eat every two hour diet we've got don't eat that you know there's so many different diets out there but to understand how how what happens and how it supports you I think that's when you can actually make an educated decision so let's talk about some of the hormones when it comes to snacking so let's talk about first let's talk about cortisol cortisol is a stress hormone and cortisol is a stress hormone and it's, it's a good, we need cortisol, we need cortisol when we're stressed. But too much cortisol can cause issues with weight. When we've got too much cortisol and we're stressed, we tend to gain weight around our abdomen. Cortisol can, too much cortisol can cause inflammation, it can affect us sleeping. And it can also give us that feeling of, you know, overwhelmed. When we feel totally overwhelmed, we're crying, we cannot deal with stressors that are coming to us in our daily life where normally we could deal with them. So that is a real indication that we've got a cortisol out of balance. Now what eating does, when we eat, we actually have a little bit of a spike in cortisol and adrenaline. So if you are constantly on fight, flight, freeze, so fight, flight, freeze is that response where you're in fight, flight mode, fight, flight, freeze. It's like that zebra being chased by the lion in the, in the Sahara. It's like Sahara, I still, no, I've got that wrong. It's like the mouse that's 
frozen when the cat's trying to eat it. You know, it kind of plays dead. It's not playing dead. It's fight, flight, freeze. It can't move. And so if we're constantly in that fight, flight, freeze, constantly then eating every couple of hours, we're just, we're just exacerbating that cortisol level. We're just pushing that cortisol level up. So to have a break and to have a good few hours between eating, you know, giving yourself about a four hour break if you've had a good meal, that can actually help to stabilize those cortisol levels and they do tend to drop down a little bit. So it can help. If you're one of those people, you're in fight, flight, freeze, you've got post-traumatic stress, you've got some stresses in your life, or you're feeling overwhelmed or you're finding it difficult to deal with the stresses around you, then it's really important to have a look at your diet and just make sure you're not eating on the hour, every hour, or even through the hour. Or sometimes people at work, they're constantly gray, so they've got a jar of nuts on their desk and they're constantly grazing. That constant grazing is just going to be that little cortisol up, 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 up. So it's really good to understand that. And if you're in that situation, to just stand back and maybe give yourself a few more hours between eating. Secondly, we've got leptin. Leptin is a satiety hormone. Leptin is secreted by fatty tissue. And what the role of leptin is to tell our body, when re leptin rises, it tells our body, everything's okay, we've got food, we don't need to be hungry. When it goes lower, we get hungry. That's what it's meant to do. But what actually happens is we eat too much, our servings are too big, we eat too frequently, or we don't eat at all. And so if you've got any of those issues going on, you've got binge eating or snacking constantly through the day, or you're not eating at all, you're missing meals, you're missing a day of food, what will happen is your leptin levels will rise and keep rising. And what that causes is it causes leptin resistance. So your body then can't regulate itself. So symptoms of leptin not being regulated, hungry after you've eaten, eating more at each meal, never feeling satisfied and just craving something. You know, when you say to yourself, I'm craving something, I feel like some food, mm, just, just need something. That can be that leptin. So it can be too high, but we've got leptin resistance. And if you continue to snack through the day, so I'm talking about constant snacking, I'm talking about grazing, I'm talking about sort of binging through the day, on the hour, every hour, on the two hour, every two hour, you're not allowing your leptin receptors to reset. And so you've got this constant rise in leptin, constantly rising. And so then you get the leptin resistance and then you're never satisfied with your food and then you snack more and you can't not snack because then you're mentally hungry, maybe not physically hungry. Another hormone that can get affected by snacking, and this is continual snacking, is progesterone. So women are so progesterone deficient. Not everybody, but in clinic, I would say probably about 85 of my patients, 85 percent of my patients have low progesterone. Low progesterone makes you feel relaxed. It makes you sleep well, helps you to lose weight, helps to regulate your fluid. You just feel so calm when your progesterone's at a really good level. It regulates fertility, it regulates the menstrual cycle. And when we eat, what tends to happen is our progesterone lowers. So each time we eat, our progesterone lowers. So if you're in fight, flight, freeze, and you've got chronic low progesterone, and you're eating all day, snacking all day, what's going to happen is you're going to get this misbalance between progesterone and cortisol. Progesterone's just going to higher, and cortisol is just going to go higher, and progesterone's just going to go lower, which leaves you in this anxious, anxious wired, tired state. Low, your serotonin low. If your serotonin is low, then that's going to cause issues. And low serotonin causes you to crave more. So have a look at why you want to snack first before we get into the snacking debate, yes or no. Why is it you are snacking? Is it the hunger? Are you craving something? Are you feeling guilt? Are you feeling shame? Are you bored? Are you lonely? Are you stressed? So look at why you need to snack first. Once you understand why you need to snack, then you can decide if you're going to snack or not. So what you need to do is you need to make sure you've got three really great balanced meals a day, which you know I talk about all the time, but it's so very important. So you start there. 
if you balance your meals really well, you can regulate insulin just fine. So a lot of people come to me and they say, I've got blood sugar problems. But if you really start to balance your meals and maybe pop a snack in between your meals first off, then you'll, you'll, you'll actually have really great blood sugar. So what I'm talking about is breakfast, lunch, dinner, snack in between breakfast and lunch, snack in between lunch and dinner. Those snacks can be anything from a mini meal to a snack, depending on you know, what your blood sugar is doing, depending on your activity, depending on what you had at those last meals. So you want to make sure that your snack is reflecting your hunger cues. So your hunger cues are you're feeling it in the belly, you're feeling hungry. Some people with blood sugar problems, insulin resistance, elevated insulin or elevated glucose or low blood glucose, people in that situation may get a little bit hypoglycemic because they may be used to snacking so much. But once you've practiced this and you've got your three great meals a day plus the two snacks in between, that's a really great strong starting point. Then you can play around with it and you can go from there and you might want to take the snack out and see how you feel. So that's a really good place to start. So snacking versus fasting. You know, this is a really big debate and this is really interesting because how you eat affects your metabolism. But your metabolism, your genetics and your hormone makeup affect how you should eat. So let's look at women and men for a moment. So men, higher testosterone, they do better fasting, they do better not eating meals. Maybe they do better on two amazing meals a day and that's all they need to eat. Maybe they do better at cramming their meals into a time slot, so just eating at night and then not eating at all. That suits men better. But women need to be conscious of their hormonal levels. If you fast, if you break too many meals, if you don't have, if you miss too many meals, it can put your testosterone and your cortisol up. And for women, we're much more sensitive to those elevations. We're much more sensitive to leptin elevation and, and lowering and resistance. So we just need to be careful. You really do need to be careful. So I would advise that your fast is, say, through the night. So let's, for example, say you have breakfast at 8 a.m., you have lunch at 1 p.m., you have dinner at 8 p.m. So between breakfast and lunch, that's a five-hour fast. Between lunch and dinner, that's a seven-hour fast. Between dinner and your next breakfast, that's an 11-hour fast. That 11-hour fast is plenty. That's enough for you. You don't need to then go, I'm, I'm going to miss breakfast and I'm not going to eat till lunch. That 11-hour fast for now is perfect for you. Now, what you might want to do at first is that five, that five hours between breakfast and lunch, if you're not having a suitable breakfast, you might feel you need a snack in between breakfast and lunch. So that's five hours. So that means if you have breakfast here and lunch here, you're sort of maybe having a snack in the middle. And that means you're going to around two hours, two hours fasting. Two hours is a healthy amount of time to fast. If you, if you eat in that two hours, that's not as good. You need to really have that two hours. So there's nothing wrong with having that, that snack in the middle. If you have a really big lunch, you have a satisfying lunch with some really great quality protein, lots of leafy greens, some fat, um, and some carbohydrate like sweet potato or pumpkin, you may be able to go till dinner, especially if you've got really strong blood sugar and your, ins and your insulin receptors are working and they're firing for you. You'll, you'll be able to do it. If you're not used to doing it, again, you may need a snack. So we've got seven hours between lunch and dinner. So just pop a snack in the middle. My advice is if, you're, if you have lunch at one and you're working, 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 you may feel like you need to have a snack around five so that you're not picking and you're not hungry before dinner. I do get some clients say they get very hungry before dinner and then when they're feeding their kids, they pick, 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 and then they're not hungry for dinner time. So just be aware of that so you can pop those snacks in the middle. So you see, and then we have dinner at eight. We've got then 11 hours of fasting, 12 hours of fasting to breakfast. And that's what's good. You know, don't eat after dinner. You have a really good dinner at eight o'clock. Definitely don't snack after dinner. Snacking at night is actually, the studies do show that snacking at night causes elevated LDL and it causes elevated fat oxidation. So that's inflammation, fat oxidation. So that can put your cholesterol up, cause weight gain, cause fat oxidation. And fat oxidation can lead to lots of nasty things, including it can you know, be a precursor to some cancers because we've got all that oxidation going on in the body. We do not want that. We want a beautifully balanced dinner 
and then we stop eating. There's no need to eat after dinner. If again, you've got very sensitive, you haven't got very sensitive insulin receptors and you go into hypoglycemia in the morning, you know, you suddenly wake up starving at four o'clock in the morning, then you may want to have a snack before you go to bed. But that's not the norm. You want to get out of that habit. Snacking is a habit. Okay, so you want to make your meals so they support your blood sugar. And that's the aim here. So remember fasting. Fasting through the night can be good because you're sleeping, you're not stressed. But what I found with lots of my clients that do fasting, that my female clients that miss breakfast, they fasted all night, they miss breakfast, and some of them exercise. They fasted all night, so they fasted for 11 hours. Then they exercise, and then they don't eat till lunch. And they're wired. Their testosterone is sky high. They've got the worst hormone resistance I've seen. Everything's super high. All the estrogens are high. Progesterone's all high. Cortisol's all high. It's just all resistant because the body's on total fight, flight, freeze the whole time. It's totally wired. And so you need to look at that and you need to really manage your meals. And I would actually write a calendar out. So if you're the kind of person that eats every hour, take it out to every two hours. So do an every two hour. If you're the kind of person at the moment that's just grazing, 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 then you need to make sure you're getting your main meals nicely balanced for you. And if you are grazing, I want you to take a step back and just think, why am I grazing? Why am I eating? Am I hungry? Or am I guilt? Am I shame? And I boredom? And I, am I stress? For me, it's boredom. I know um, for me very much boredom. And I work from home a couple of days a week. You can see I'm at home today. I'm working from home today. I'm at the computer. And I will. I, I used to be a real snacker. I used to just go to the fridge. Suddenly my hand would be in the fridge grazing and I'd be eating all those nuts and stuff. But I really make sure if I balance my breakfast, I had a really great breakfast this morning just before this. I had some um, leftover chicken from last night, cup of leftover chicken from last night. I had an egg. I had some halloumi. I had a um, couple of cups of kale, some garlic. Mix that all up, um, saute that all in a little bit of butter. I added some turmeric, some salt. And I had one and I had a potato that was left over from dinner last night, um, a little bit of potato, which is my which is my carbohydrate. Mix it up. It's a really big bowl. I had that. I was up at five. I had that at eight. And so now I won't have lunch until one or two. So it will last me till then. I, I won't need anything because I won't be hungry. And if I am, it's more likely to do craving. It's more likely to do with stress. So. Just have a listen in, really tune in to your body, really tune in to why it is you're snacking. And my advice is if you are snacking every hour, let's bring it out to two hours. If your blood sugar is unsteady, then you need to be conscious of making sure you're snacking on protein and a little bit of fat. You need to keep your blood sugar going. Coconut is wonderful for insulin resistance, diabetes. So I would add coconut oil in definitely. You can add coconut oil into your herb teas. Um, there was one other thing I wanted to talk about. I can't remember now. I've gone, bl I've gone blank. Yes, yeah, so we talked about the progesterone and we talked about the cortisol. So the cortisol going up with, with, with um, snacking. And what actually, over time, what cortisol does, the more it goes up, like I said, it causes that hormone resistance. So it actually can cause insulin resistance. It can cause progesterone resistance. And it can cause estrogen resistance so that's why we actually need to be careful with our stress levels as well through the day so first off start with asking yourself why do you need to snack have a look at what you'll have a do a little food diary and see what you're actually eating through the day see when you're consuming and try and write a little schedule up get your breakfast your lunch and your dinner really set down really look at that and make sure that's nutted out for you and if you are a frequent eater you eat every hour Maybe just make pull it out to two hours and pop a meat and pop a snack in between. This will help your metabolism. It will help to reset your hormones, but it ultimately also helps to get your body into place where it can start getting to the desired weight, the weight that's natural for your body. You know, so if that's weight loss for some people, it might be gaining. Some people it might be loss. So it will help you to reach that goal. Um, okay, so that was it for today. I've talked through, I mean, I've done a lot of talking today. And so tomorrow I'm going to do a Q&A on snacking. So tomorrow I'm going to talk about the best times to snack, the best things to snack on. And ultimately, if you're hungry, if you're ever hungry, or if you get that lightheadedness, you know, that tiredness or that hangry or that moodiness, 
make sure you have a savoury snack. Don't have fruit and don't have sweets because that's just going to pop it out again, your blood sugar out. So really have that. And if you want to have fruit, have it after you've eaten, you know. Don't have it necessarily on its own, especially if you've got... Um, especially if you've got insulin resistance or diabetes, you shouldn't be having fruit on its own. I would have it after a main meal, have it in a little bowl maybe after lunch or that kind of thing, or straight after dinner. If you have dinner early, you can have it straight after dinner and then not eat after that, just a little bit of fruit. So I would do that. So we're going to talk about the best snacks to have. I'm going to talk about blood, um, blood glucose, insulin, and also diabetes and the best way to snack. And then I'm going to talk about you know the timing and how you can time it and also the signs to look out for Plus, I'm going to be answering your questions. So if you've got any questions, just pop your questions below or you can email me. I did get a ton of questions through in response to my email I sent last night. So I'll be answering those questions tomorrow. They're really great questions. So hopefully I can get through all of those for you tomorrow. And then I'll be summarizing this and I'll be popping it up on my blog and sending it out so you can see exactly what, what we're talking about when it comes to snacking. So I hope that was helpful. I'd really love to hear from you. If you've got any questions, please pop them below. And have a great day and I'll talk to you all soon. Bye bye.